Yes, thank you very much. Um, thank you for inviting me to talk to you this afternoon. So uh, just very quickly, I'd like to introduce uh, Global Action on Men's Health, or GAM, as we call it for short. Uh, we were launched in uh, 2014 and became a UK-based international charity in 2019. Uh, we have about 50 uh, organisational and individual members, and almost all of the men's health organisations around the world, all the significant men's health organisations, are uh, members of our network. Our mission is, on the one hand, very simple, but also very ambitious, um, and it's to create a world where all men and boys have the opportunity to achieve the best possible health and well-being wherever they live and whatever their backgrounds. And our main focus is on policy, trying to change and improve policy at the global and national levels, and to try and encourage exactly what you're talking about here, the development of policies that are much more uh, sympathetic uh, to men's health. And I think it's also important to say that we work very closely and increasingly closely with women's health organisations um, to try and put a gendered approach to health policy on the policy agenda. Um, and it's, it's very important to our work uh, that we don't see men and women as being in competition, that we don't see men's health and women's health as a binary issue and you have to choose one or the other. This isn't a zero-sum game. Um, we think that better men's health Will be good for women's health and vice versa. Just a little bit about me and uh, as Mike said I'm director of global action on men's health. I used to do the job that Martin now does. I was chief exec at the Men's Health Forum until 2012. Um, I'm a fellow at the Royal Society for Public Health. I co-chair the Men and COVID, uh, Men and COVID-19 group which is an international network of uh, clinicians and academics who are interested in the impact of COVID on men, and, and Martin has already mentioned uh, the disproportionate impact of COVID on serious disease and mortality in men. And I think one of the reasons why we're seeing such a big impact on men's health from COVID is that men's health has been neglected for so long. If men, if men didn't have uh, the, the disproportionate um, uh, uh, burden of think conditions like hypertension, lung disease, and so on, the underlying conditions that contribute to serious COVID disease, then COVID wouldn't have had such a big impact on men's health. So if we'd had more a more strategic approach to men's health in the past, I think COVID would have had a far lesser impact on the health of men. And also I wanted to mention, because I think it's particularly pertinent to what we're talking about here, I, I, I was invited by the uh, Department of Health in Ireland a few years ago to, do an in, to lead an independent review of Ireland's national men's health policy. So that gave me a, a, a pretty unique insight into the potential uh, for men's health policies and, the, um, and, and not only what they can achieve, but also where they can go wrong and how they need to be devised in a way uh, that makes them more likely to have a positive impact. And I'm going to say more about the Irish men's health policy uh, in a minute. The next point I wanted to make is that men's health strategies and men's health policies aren't uh, some kind of weird idea. Uh, they've actually been around for a while and many countries have actually adopted them. The WHO, as Alan has said, now has um, a strategy for Europe. Um, and the, the UK government um, is signed up to that. It's one of, UK is obviously one of the 53 member states of the WHO European region, and all 53 states signed up to the European uh, Men's Health Strategy in 2018. But the WHO region for the Americas, which is known as PAHO, the Pan American Health Organization, is actively considering a men's health strategy. And in fact, it would have probably published one by now if COVID hadn't got in the way. Um, and we also know that the WHO region for the Western Pacific, which covers China, Australia, New Zealand, Malaysia, um, and, and a, a large number of other countries in that region, is also now actively considering men's health. And we hope that that, that will end up with a strategy for the Western Pacific region as well. Seven individual countries now have men's health policies. They're quite a diverse group, an interesting mix of countries, some you might not expect, but Australia, Brazil, Iran, Ireland, Malaysia, Mongolia, and South Africa now all have men's health policies, and we can learn a lot, learn a lot uh, from their experience. And also several states in Australia, 
and the Canadian province of Quebec also have men's health strategies. So with a lot of experience here uh, that we can draw on. Just to mention the European strategy in a bit more detail, as I said, it covers all 53 states, including the UK, and the UK is a signatory uh, for the strategy. Um, and it has three main objectives. And I think these objectives um, could easily form the, the core objectives of a strategy for England. Uh, they are to reduce premature mortality among men, uh, to improve health and well-being among men of all ages while reducing inequalities, and to improve gender equality through structures and policies that advance men's engagement in self-care, fatherhood, unpaid care, violence prevention, and sexual and reproductive health. Now, I just want to move on now to Ireland's uh, men's health policy, uh, because, as I said, I was involved in the independent review. Um, there, in fact, there have been two policies in Ireland. Uh, the first ran from 2008 to 13, and that was the one that I looked at. And then the second one uh, followed in 2017, and it's now in its last year. Now, the review of the first policy found that it was a, the progress was mixed. Uh, but significant progress was made to achieving, achieving three of the strategic aims. Uh, the first was promoting an increased focus on men's health research. And perhaps more importantly, um, the, there was real progress in developing health promotion initiatives that support men to adopt positive health behaviours and to, an incre to increase control over their lives. And in fact, there was a real explosion in Ireland in the number of locally based uh, men's health programs, often reaching groups that you'd think would be quite hard to reach. So a lot of work, for example, with the farming community, reaching male farmers in Ireland, and that was incredibly successful, and also a lot of work in uh, low-income and deprived uh, neighbourhoods. And the third area where a lot of progress was made was in building social capital within communities of men, and that really means tackling male isolation, developing men's social networks and one of the main ways that was done was through the development of men's sheds now by that i don't mean you know men going to the shed at the bottom of their garden men's sheds are community-based uh, workshops effectively where men mainly older men meet to engage in in what well, to socialize uh, but also usually to do sort of craft-based activities like woodwork metalwork repairing bikes that kind of thing and the number of sheds in Ireland increased from one in 2008 to over 220 uh, a few years later. So the strategy had a real impact in developing that kind of uh, locally based activity. There was also very good progress in developing training programs uh, for health and other professionals. A training program called Engage had an enormous impact um, uh, on the on the work on the um, health workforce in Ireland and really skilled up uh, professionals to engage better with men and I think any strategy that emerges in England or the rest of the UK has to have training as a central part of it because we can't expect people to wake up in the morning and suddenly do men's health people need to have a certain set of skills a certain knowledge base to do that effectively and a training program can really contribute to that we also found in the review that the number and scope of the strategic aims and actions was too, exten too extensive. Essentially, the strategy tried to do too much too quickly. There were also problems with governance, funding and implementation. And funding was a particular problem and the timing wasn't great, frankly, because the Irish strategy was published just at the time when the financial crisis meant that the Irish economy hit the buffers. So there was very little money available. Um, but despite that, there nevertheless was a, um, uh, because a lot of the activity was community based and run by volunteers in local communities, um, a huge amount was still achieved. There was strong support uh, in all sectors for the continuation of a male targeted policy and for the development of a second national policy. So even though there were problems with the first policy, the overwhelming majority of people who were involved with it and working in the health sector wanted, it, wanted a policy approach to continue in men's health. Um, and the review also uh, recommended uh, that a second policy should be realistic, focused, achievable, 
and also aligned with broader public health priorities. The pub overarching public health policy in Ireland was called Healthy Ireland, and it was very clear that for the men's health policy to, um, to achieve its potential uh, in, in its second version, that it had to be closely aligned to the overarching policy. And I think that's also something to consider uh, for policy um, in the UK. And that's the, the second uh, Irish policy called Healthy Island Men, uh, the acronym for which is HIM or HIM, which of course is particularly appropriate. So the broad lessons, looking at what we know from Ireland and also from other countries, uh, what, what can we conclude about what men's health policies can deliver? What is there, what can they actually do? Well, firstly, I think they can create a vision and an identity for men's health. Men's health can appear on the face of it to be a very broad, quite vague concept. And I think a policy can actually help to define what that means in a particular country um, and make it clear to people what, what the point of it is, what it's actually setting out to do, what, what is meant by men's health in that country. It can identify men's health as a priority area um, and provide leverage for expanding men's health work. They can actually uh, in, encourage um, the development of, of further work in men's health. It can act as a blueprint and a resource for practitioners and ongoing policy development. It can actually provide a kind of roadmap uh, to people in the field, explaining what they need to do and how they need to go about it. And it can catalyze increased men's health activity in specific areas like health promotion, occupational and workplace health, community development, and so on. Policies can also encourage intersectoral works, bringing together perhaps the private and the public sector, and also different government departments who can be encouraged to work together. So a men's health policy, I think, has, can be more than just a policy for the Department of Health. It can involve education, uh, social services, transport, housing, and so on. And it can set out a, a strategy for, uh, for interdepartmental cooperation so bringing different departments together to work on a common goal. And it can provide a platform to embed men's health policy within the wider policy landscape. So um, I think we've also learned that to be effective, policies and strategies need to be based on wide consultation. They can't just simply be delivered from on high, from the top down. Uh, they need to involve uh, as many stakeholders as possible and men themselves. And I think the women's, the way the government's going about the women's health strategy really is a good model for how to do this. As far as I can see, it is involving an extensive consultation process, and I think that will result uh, in a better policy. It's essential that to be effective, policies have to be supported at a high level. So having a ministerial involvement, I think, will, will make an enormous difference, and also having effective governance. And I think it would be useful to, to consider having, for example, a, a, a senior uh, government official having responsibility for men's health, not as something that's tacked on to a hundred other responsibilities, but somebody who's dedicated uh, to perform that role. There needs to be funding attached, because obviously if there's funding available uh, to, to develop men's health work, then people are more likely to do it. The policy, policies need to be committed to action, uh, and contain an implementation plan. They mustn't just be nice ideas that will be good to have. They need to be action focused and actually set out a roadmap with miles. How are you going to do this? When are you going to do it by? And whose responsibility it is? As I said, uh, being practical, realistic and aligned with existing priorities will help. And I think it's very important that progress and implementation uh, is inclusive of civil society organisations because involving NGOs um, not only brings in particular sets of expertise, um, but it also um, uh, uh, organisations that perhaps are working more closely with the local communities, um, but it also means that, that it can accelerate uh, progress towards implementation because um, NGOs can often move faster uh, than uh, the public sector. I'll just leave you with this slide because I think it's interesting. Um, in the UK, uh, between 2008 and 2008 is when the first Irish men's health policy was published. In the UK, since 2008, well, between then and 2018, male life expectancy went up by 1.7 years. In Ireland, 
over the over the 10 years since the first uh, men's health policy, like male life expectancy went up by 2.6 years. Now, I can't prove that the greater increase in life expectancy in Ireland was down to the men's health policy, uh, but I can't prove that it wasn't. Uh, but I just leave that I'll just leave that with you as um, perhaps something worth reflecting on and thinking about. So um, that's it for me. Thank you very much indeed for listening.